Good morning. Well, I want to welcome you to the 61st Annual Rural Life Conference. I want to, take you, I want to thank you for taking time off from your very busy schedules and attending the conference this year. Uh, this year's theme, if you've had a chance to look at your programs, is promoting the vitality of Arkansas communities. And this is indeed a timely, timely um, theme. And one of the reasons it's so, it's so timely is because our communities are in danger now. And also agriculture is facing some very critical times. Um, rural communities are losing population. Right now, the populations in rural communities and cities is roughly 50-50 for the country. Uh, but by the year 2050, you're going to notice that about 70% of the population will reside in cities and 30% in rural areas. And so to help promote the vitality of our communities, we need to do a couple of things. We need to develop better ag technologies like high tunnels and hoop houses to make agriculture, small scale agriculture more profitable. Uh, we also need to encourage growing profitable crops like sweet potatoes and healthy vegetables. Uh, we need to look at continuing to do research to improve the profitability and marketing of aquaculture products. Uh, we also need to encourage healthy eating techniques and increase access to healthy and nutritious food to help fight obesity. This year's conference is just a little bit different because uh, we're going to have all of the conference here at the convention center. Um, last year we got a suggestion from a smart man that said, well, maybe the convention center staff can put up some temporary classrooms so you don't have to go back and forth across town. And so we took that person's advice and want to thank Mr. Kirkendall. There are, are a lot of smart people that have come out of Chico County, and he's one of them. <laughs> um, also, we have a couple of changes to the program. Uh, the invocation will be given by Reverend Iris Cole Crosby, and she will be followed by our new mayor, Mayor Washington, who will give us a welcome to the city. Um, so the rest of the program will, will proceed as printed and we'll stand on existing protocol. Thank you. Good morning. The word of God states that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, they and all that dwell therein. Would you join me for the invocation at this time? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day that you have made, and we choose to rejoice and to be glad in it. We thank you for blessing those that are in authority over us. We ask that you would bless this conference and bless the participants. Bless all those that have a role, that have something to say, those that have something that they would like to hear. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning. I am so honored to come before you this morning to extend to you a heartfelt welcome on behalf of the city of Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Welcome to the 61st annual UAPB Rural Life Conference. I believe the theme for this conference promoting the vitality of Arkansas communities is critical for our city. I think it's critical for our surrounding areas, promoting the vitality of Arkansas communities. I can relate to rural Arkansas communities because I grew up in a small community here in Jefferson County, Arkansas. I grew up in Gethsemane. Some may better, better know it as Gethsemane. My parents toiled to make a living on a small cotton farm and vehemently stressed the importance of hard work and education. I was taught that church and school would be the passport for a life from a life of labor to successful futures. My mother and father with third and fourth grade educations respectively were blessed to witness in their lifetime all seven of their children receiving college degrees and five of them from right here in Pine Bluff, UAPB, AM and N. All of their children entering respectable careers and becoming God-fearing, law-abiding citizens. Workshops at this conference are promoting people to revitalize our communities and improve life all across Southeast Arkansas. I encourage us as we attend this conference and take in all of its sessions 
to gain knowledge and ideas from the conference to empower and strengthen our real communities, and I believe it will. I believe it will promote community gardens and urban agriculture, ensure equity and education for every student in our community, create healthier communities through locally grown food and access to fresh fruits and vegetables, ensure sustainability of our environment and preserving this incredible place we all call home. We welcome you to our city, Pine Bluff, Arkansas. We thank you for coming. We thank you for what you're doing to move our communities forward. We hope you enjoy your beautiful day in Pine Bluff and best wishes for a very productive conference today. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Lawrence Alexander, Chancellor of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. I'd like to welcome you to the 61st Annual Rural Life Conference. We are delighted you are here. We are delighted to once again serve as the host. This conference is a tribute. It's a tribute to the legacy of Professor Simon Alexander Haley, Director of Agriculture for A&M College, and Dr. S.J. Parker, who organized the first conference in 1955 and chaired it for 30 years. This is a testament to their vision and insight into the needs of this region and that they were able to begin this movement to improve the quality of life in rural America in this area through education and through collaboration. We appreciate the collaboration and support that we have from our partners in government and nonprofits in the public and private sector and those in farming and those who study and contribute to farming interests and those who are concerned about the improvement of life in rural communities. We're pleased to have two dynamic speakers here today. Dr. Carolyn Crockle, she's the Director of the Division of Family and Consumer Sciences with NIFA. Uh, we're pleased to have you here with us. We, uh, we were uh, uh, honored to have uh, the Director of NIFA for our last commencement here. The, uh, uh, Sunny Ramaswamy, Dr. Ramaswamy did a fantastic job. Please extend my best, my, my best uh, regards to him. Uh, the, uh, we're also, we also will have uh, Senator Jack Crumley, uh, a senior, as our luncheon speaker, and we're delighted uh, to have him. So on behalf of the faculty and staff and the students and stakeholders and friends of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, I'd like to welcome you uh, once again to the conference and hope you have a wonderful day here. Thank you.
to introduce to you our S.A. Haley Memorial Lecturer, Dr. Carolyn Crokel. Dr. Crokel is the current director of the Division of Family and Consumer Sciences within USDA's Institute of Food and Agriculture, also known as NIFA. She has held this position since 2010. And in this role, she leads the division's community, vitality, and family well-beings portfolio of research, education, and extension projects, which includes active research studies, competitive funding, and building federal capacity in these areas. Dr. Krokel is also wearing a second hat. She's the acting deputy director of the Institute of Youth, Families, and Communities, uh, which supports the human and social components of NIFA's food and agricultural sciences through research, education, and extension programs. This institute's programs support socioeconomic prosperity by strengthening individuals, families, communities, providing resources for the next generation of food and agricultural scientists, and offering youth leadership experiences. Prior to this experience, she had a role in NIFA, wh where she served as the Director of Nutrition and Family Sciences section of um, USDA's Cooperative Research, Education, and Extension Service. And while there, she facilitated the coordination of research, education, and extension across the human sciences discipline. She was the national program leader for family and human development and consumer sciences in this role as well. Dr. Carroll, 
Dr. Krokel, rather, received her bachelor's in psychology, master's in counseling and human development, and a doctorate in adult education and res human resource development from the State University of New York at Albany. She is certified in family and consumer sciences. She holds a certificate in aging studies from Medical College of Virginia. She has served as NIFA's cultural transformation champion and she also received the NIFA AJ Dye Diversity Award. In addition to that, she's an Embassy Science Fellow, a National Service Fellow, and a graduate of the Federal Executive Institute focusing on leadership in a democratic society. These are just a few of her accomplishments. And as you know, you don't just start at the top. There's a journey involved, and she is going to tell us about her journey and what she's doing. So we are so very pleased that she's here with us at this conference. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Krokel. Good morning, everyone. It's very hard to follow that beautiful choir. Um, so inspiring and just, just lovely. And so I hope I, I can do justice to the gift that they have given us this morning. Um, as I begin this uh, presentation, I want you to keep in mind that today is National Day of Unplugging. So for those of us who are baby boomers or the previous generation, we, you know, we grew up with maybe one telephone in the house or a party line or, you know, if you got a battery operated calculator, you were like, you know, after $600, you were the it person. Um, so unplugging is not necessarily so difficult for us, but I think for our Gen Xers and Millennials, uh, a day without technology, without social media is, is almost unheard of. But it is that national day, so I encourage you, uh, in the context of what I'm going to say to you today, to, to think about unplugging for the day. Except you can tweet out your conference. Uh. <laughs> Very important. So, so thank you very much. I just really would like to thank the UAPB School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Human Sciences. Um, certainly Chancellor Alexander, Mayor Washington was here, that was great. Uh, Dr. Buckner, Dr. Martin for inviting me here. And really all of you, I, I appreciate your time and your attention today. And um, I'm going to start a slideshow, and it has a couple of different um, uh, things that I want to accomplish today. One is to sort of give you a theme of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, not necessarily in the order that I'm talking, but it'll give you a flavor for what I'm trying to convey to you. And also, uh, maybe distract you in case I make any mistakes, you'll be looking up there and I won't have to think about that so much. So, um, so I've been to Arkansas once before. It was about 15 years ago and I came to interview uh, at the University of Arkansas for a gerontology position. Um, and at the same time I was interviewing in DC and I'll tell you a little bit about that later, but um, I thought Arkansas was incredible, incredibly beautiful. The, the people, the natural resources. Um, even yesterday coming here from Washington, um, I had to just stop a minute and think, why, why are these people being so nice? You know, when you're in D.C., everything's very focused on moving and, you know, getting things done and really not paying attention to people and what's going on around you. And, and so it's nice to just sort of take a deep breath and sit back and say, this is what real America is. You know, people who are very happy to say hello to you, what do you need? Um, so, so that's really great. Um, and as I was looking at how I was going to approach this presentation, I, I really wanted to think about Arkansas. Um, it's the land of 600,000 acres of lakes, two and a half million acres of national forests, handmade dulcimers, precious gems, Walmart, President Clinton, Johnny Cash, General Douglas MacArthur, I did not know was from Arkansas. It's the land of the UAPB Golden Lions, this beautiful choir, and also it's the natural state. To be called the natural state, that's amazing. It's where family roots run deep. And you know, as I was looking at this, this beautiful state, so many things uh, were coming to the surface about your world. 
It's such an honor to be here with you today to give the uh, Simon Alexander Haley Memorial Lecture. Um, when I researched him, what an incredibly distinguished man he was, and the conference theme of promoting community vitality, uh, or vitality for Arkansas communities would have really resonated with him. You know, to, to learn that he was the father of Alex Haley, who authored Roots, which had a, a, a tremendous impact a, a, on me when I was younger. Um, just, just, just an incredible honor for me. When we think about community vitality, we could certainly speak about it in a variety of different contexts and at different levels, macro level, micro level. Um, community vitality has been defined as a community's collective capacity to respond to change with an enhanced level of participation, with aspirations for a healthy and productive community. It is the people's pursuit of a shared vision of place. At USDA, we focus a great deal on community resource and economic development. This includes things such as jobs created, jobs retained, and the value of grants procured. It includes community planning, inclusive participation, and community leadership, volunteer hours associated with community-based programming, and the number of individuals taking on new leadership roles in their communities. It's helping communities deal with challenges like land use and smart growth, natural resource and water quality issues, local government operations and finances, economic development including labor force issues, community decision making and leadership issues, broadband infrastructure, all of the challenges that come with communities. So today we can discuss working with local governments, we can talk about civic organizations, businesses and community leaders to help identify critical local concerns and set goals and work on solutions. We can talk about working with teachers and students, environmental and conservation groups and businesses that rely on water and land resources. We can create awareness on enhancing local decisions based on the knowledge of implications and broad public involvement. We can talk about helping people adopt environmentally and economically efficient practices, enhancing community and economic diversity, and strong local trusted leadership. We can talk about providing access to knowledge on organizing skills linkages to information and resource networks that address locally important issues. We can talk about engaging knowledge of options for development and regulations affecting various situations in our communities. And we can talk about providing resource-based information that can come from interdisciplinary analysis. We can talk about introducing best management practices adoption or offering educational support to organizations and government that promote efficiency and effectiveness. Improving the vitality and stability of rural communities in the United States continues to be an important public policy objective and is especially relevant in a rapidly changing global environment. With growing concerns over income inequality, rural depopulation, a healthy and vibrant rural America has a major role to play in supporting the United States as a global agricultural and e economic leader. At USDA, my boss's boss, the director of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, Dr. Sonny Ramaswamy, who was mentioned earlier, he often talks about the year 2050 and what will it take to be able to feed a world of nine plus billion people that will inhabit this planet. To be a strong and sound partner of urban America, rural communities require public and private support to build physical and human capability. The intricate interplay between urban and rural areas requires strategic investments to ensure the well-being of both. While rural places often look to urban for specialized services and concentrated markets, urban areas depend on rural communities for food energy, resources, and natural amenities. This rural-urban interdependency necessitates investments that ensure the health and well-being of both areas. Rural areas contribute in vital ways to national well-being, and it is important to invest in these areas, maintaining them as livable places. 
it's, it's, it's as important to do that it is, as it is to invest in urban areas, including inner cities and the suburbs. While the rural population comprises about 15% of the United States total population, they're responsible for stewardship of over 70% of the nation's land area. From this large land comes much of the agriculture, forestry, and energy production that not only fuels the U.S. economy, but also a major part of the global economy. As a result, rural, urban residents depend heavily on rural economies and resources. The capability and ability to produce many types of goods and services in rural areas and transport them efficiently to urban uh, areas keeps cost of living low for the entire nation. In addition, a growing rural recreational sector provides welcome and inviting relief for urban populations. And the option to move back to rural communities is increasingly important to many aging baby boomers like myself. I keep looking, where am I going to live? It's not going to be in Washington when I retire. Um, as well as millennials seeking to, seeking to raise their families in rural areas. The importance of rural areas for national economic security is evident from, re the, from the percent of the nation's total employment found in rural areas in industries that are critical to the country's economic well-being as a whole. Agriculture and food, water, most of our water resources come from rural America, raw materials, the manufacturing economy, the recreation economy, the energy economy, and national security. A disproportionate share of veterans come from rural areas, and, share, and the share of disabled veterans is also higher in rural than urban areas. And I thought about all of these things as I was preparing to talk to you today, from that macro level, talking about community vitality is so important and so critical to the development of our communities. But also as I began to formulate my thoughts for today, I began to consider that in today's rapidly changing society, the foundational aspects of community vitality really begin at the individual level. And let me explain what I mean by that. I grew up in western New York, just south of Buffalo. We know it now as the Rust Belt of the United States. Uh, it was known for the steel industry and from, for the uh, grain industry and, and so many things that uh, were an economic boon to, to many people in that area. There's so much poverty and so much, so much hopelessness, hopelessness there today, and there's really little opportunity for people. And it truly is a rust belt. If you drive around my hometown, buildings are just in, in decay that were once thriving uh, companies, manufacturing companies. There's a lot of substance abuse, opioid uh, abuse, uh, meth. There, there's so many things that are really so detrimental to my community. And looking back, there was great poverty when I was growing up, but somehow we didn't live this. I think it was because we always had hope. My mother had eight children and I was the second oldest. And by the time I got old enough to have children, I was like, I already did that. <laughs> no. When you're the second oldest, you do a lot of uh, uh, child caregiving. Um, but, you know, growing up there and then, we had a, a sense of community, we had a sense of hope. Um, and I don't sense that now when I go back home, and I know many, con uh, many communities in the United States are feeling this way. When I was 22, I married a soldier, and I moved everywhere, and I lived everywhere. I moved 13 times in 21 years, and everywhere we went, I tried to create a sense of community and belonging for my family and my children, which meant you know, establishing a relationship with my local church and building my friendships and, and uh, really trying to help my children have a sense of community, only to have to pull up every route and move a couple years later. When my husband retired from the Army in 2002, he said, now honey, you have moved everywhere I've asked you to go. Now it's your turn to decide. Where would you most like to live? I said, I want to go to Washington, D.C., where I will have an opportunity to affect real change. And he took my hand, and he looked into my eyes, and he said, 
absolutely not. <laughs> he had avoided the Pentagon his entire military career. So um, eventually he gave in because he knew how much it meant to me. Um, my first job in DC was working for a small nonprofit, um, writing some legislation, being able to go to the Hill. I was running the National Center for Grandparents Raising Grandchildren. And when I first started at this agency, um, my boss gave me some great advice that's still with me today. Um, she said, the only way to make a real difference in people's lives is to build community wherever you go. I was puzzled by this and I asked her what she meant and she said to truly build community you must begin at the individual level. On the elevator, at the coffee shop, at the food truck, on the bus, on the train. Look up, reach out, show concern, smile, learn people's names, start conversations, build community. I, I have never forgotten this. So community vitality is not just about economic uh, development of communities at the macro level. It's about building strong relationships among people at the individual level. I saw a video uh, a while back that said, we're more connected than we have ever been through technology, 24-7 news, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all of our social media resources. Yet one in five people in this country suffers from chronic loneliness. And you know that's, that's really just such a profound statement. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I read a, a true story a while back. And uh, some of you may have heard this, so bear with me. But I really wanted to share it with you today. And it goes something like this. 20 years ago, I drove a cab for a living. One night, I took a fare at 2.30 a.m. and when I arrived to collect, the building was dark except for a single light in the ground floor window. Under these circumstances, many drivers would just honk once. But I had seen too many impoverished people who depended on taxis as their only means of transportation. Unless a situation smelled of danger, I always went to the door. This passenger might be someone who needs my assistance. I reasoned this to myself. So I walked to the door and knocked. Just a minute, answered a frail elderly voice. I could hear something being dragged across the floor. After a long pause, the door opened. A small woman in her 80s stood before me. She was wearing a print dress and a pillbox hat with a veil pinned on it, like somebody out of a 1940s movie. By her side was a small nylon case. The apartment looked as if no one had lived there for years. All the furniture was covered with sheets. There were no clocks on the walls, no knickknacks or utensils on the counters. In the corner was a cardboard box filled with photos. Would you carry my bag out to the car, she said. I took the suitcase to the cab and then returned to assist the woman. She took my arm and we walked slowly to the curb. She kept thanking me for my kindness. It's nothing, I told her. I just try to treat my passengers the way I would want my mother to be treated. Oh, you're such a good man, she said. When we got in the cab, she gave me an address and then asked, could you drive me through downtown? It's not the shortest way, I answered quickly. Oh, I don't mind, she said. I'm in no hurry. I'm on my way to hospice. I looked in the rearview mirror. Her eyes were glistening. I don't have any family left, she continued. The doctor says I don't have very long. I quietly reached over and shut off the meter. What route would you like me to take, I asked. For the next two hours, we drove through the city. She showed me the building where she had once worked as an elevator operator. We drove through the neighborhood where she and her husband had lived when they were newlyweds. She, she had me pull up in front of a furniture warehouse that had been a ballroom where she had gone dancing as a girl. Sometimes she'd show me, she'd ask me to slow in front of a particular building or corner and would sit staring in the darkness saying nothing. As the first hint of sun creases the horizon, she suddenly says, I'm tired, let's go now. We drove in silence to the address she had given me. It was a low building, like a small convalescent home with a driveway that passed under a portico. Two orderlies came out to the cab as soon as we pulled up. They were solicitous and intent, watching her every move. They must have been expecting her. I opened the trunk and took the small suitcase to the door. The woman was already seated in a wheelchair. 
How much do I owe you, she asked, reaching for her purse. Nothing, I said. You have to make a living, she answered. Oh, there are other passengers, I responded. Almost without thinking, I bent and gave her a hug. She held on to me tightly. Our, our hug ended with this remark. You gave an old woman a little moment of joy. After a slight pause, she added, thank you. I squeezed her hand and then walked into the dim morning light. Behind me, a door shut. It was the sound of the closing of a life. I didn't pick up any more passengers that shift. I drove aimlessly lost in thought. For the rest of the day, I could hardly talk. What if that woman had gotten an angry driver or one who was impatient with his shift to end? What if I had refused to take the run or had honked once and then driven away? On a quick review, I don't think I, I have ever done anything more important in my life. We're conditioned to think that our lives revolve around great moments. But great moments often catch us unaware, beautifully wrapped in what others may consider a small one. What matters most to the vitality of community life is the number of people who regularly connect, build trust, and get involved with one another. We're all made up of so many deep and rich stories and experiences, but we often just interact at a very superficial level and don't know the depth of what someone is experiencing. So think about that today. Think about the last time uh, someone helped you, a selfless person, um, or that you helped someone selflessly, and what that felt like and what it may have meant to that person. When I think about that, the most recent thing that happened to me, um, it was a few days ago in the grocery store, a young boy who was maybe nine or 10, he was checking out in front of me in the line and he was buying one of those cans of Pringles. And I had seen them on the shelf and the sign said, um, 10 cans for $10, right? So you think it's a dollar a can. <laughs> So when he got to pay, he got out his dollar and he gave it to the cashier and the cashier said, no, it's only a dollar if you buy 10. Um, otherwise, it's a dollar 25. And I could see that the boy was getting really embarrassed and panicking. So I took a quarter out and I said, here, let me get this and, and gave him the money and he paid. And after he finished and I was checking out, he was waiting at the end of the counter. And I was like, oh, that's, that's nice. Maybe he just wants to say thank you again. And when I finished and my groceries were bagged, he said, um, may I help you out to your car? I can put the groceries in your trunk for you. And I thought to myself, wow, that's the best 25 cents I ever spent. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, I really love the theme of this year's conference, promoting the vitality of Arkansas communities. Um, the foundation of our community vitality truly is our people. Society is changing rapidly. It's our actions that tell our stories. It's not our words. It's not our intentions. It's not our dreams. It's not our wants. It's not who we are. It's not who we wish we were. Only what we do, that's what builds communities. I travel all over the country, and at events like these, I often see people, including myself, kind of sitting off alone or eating by myself or uh, you know, sometimes you'll see people by themselves, they may be new to the event and sort of sitting watching groups of people. Um, they may seem standoffish, and that's not very often the case. They're just waiting for someone to, to say welcome. And I've seen a lot of that here today, so I sort of feel like I'm preaching to the choir today. Um, but I challenge each of you at this conference to reach out to a stranger, to assist, uh, to introduce yourself, uh, and to build community right here. And when this is over, reach out some more tomorrow, next week, next year. Be a role model. Be a mentor. Be an inspiration to other people. These seemingly small gestures are the true foundations of community vitality on which everything else can be built. I'm very excited and honored to be with you today. I'm staying for the entire event. Um, and you know what, after 15 years in D.C., it's good to escape a little bit. Um, I've, I've gotten the full taste of what working to affect change truly means in D.C. So I hope you enjoy the events. I, I, I know that I will, and I hope I get to know some of you while I'm here. So have a great day, and thank you for having me.
Thank you for that wonderful presentation, and it is indeed an honor to present you with the Simon A. Haley Memorial Medal. Uh, Professor Simon Alexander Haley was the director of Agriculture AM and N College and initiated the idea of a rural life conference. Uh, the first conference was held in 1950, and although it was attended by only a small group of 15 people, it included a wealth of information. Short courses were planned for farmers, women, youth, and ministers. Uh, topics included economics, poultry, and husbandry, along with horticulture, nutrition, health, recreation, and social life. Uh, as I said, it's an honor to present you with this medal, so let me get the medal out. We want to thank you for the work that you do for our country and for the vitality of our communities. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Jason Smedley, Assistant Director of Public Affairs and Governmental Relations for Arkansas Farm Bureau. We'd like to invite you up to the stage now and uh, provide some remarks, please, from Farm Bureau. Good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Jason Smedley, and I'm originally from Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, I just have my own personal rural life story. Uh, I also spent some time in D.C. I, I stayed in D.C. for about 10 years. I've been in the Marine Corps for about 17 years, so I've been able to travel the world and deploy. But my family uh, is from Union County. I don't know if some of you know where Union County is, but uh, there we go. <laughs> but, um, you know, as I traveled, and when I was in D.C., my, I worked on Capitol Hill, uh, deployed a couple of times, went to school there, but my last stop was at the Pentagon. Unfortunately, I was not able to avoid the Pentagon. And it just drained me, and it just made me miss Arkansas. And I couldn't wait to come back to Arkansas. And so, moved back to Little Rock. But I just want to say my, my favorite memories, my childhood memories, uh, were in Union County at my grandmother's house uh, at this little town called Huddock, Arkansas. So I don't know if some of you know where Huddock is. Huddock is below El Dorado. Below El Dorado, you have Strong, and then you have... Huddick. All right. But anyway, greatest memories, you know, it, it is, uh, if I want to get my best sleep, I go to Huddick. If I want to get a good plate of food, I go to Huddick. If I want to feel loved by family, I want to be surrounded by family, I go to Huddick. So I see the value personally in rural life and what it's meant to me and what it's meant to my children and to my family. And it means a lot also to Arkansas Farm Bureau Federation. And Arkansas Farm Bureau Federation is pleased to partner with UAPB uh, in this Rural Life Conference. And we were there from the beginning, and we want to continue to be a part of this effort. Farm Bureau is the voice of agriculture in Arkansas. We have over 190,000 member families throughout the state. And we're made up of farmers and ranchers and rural families that create our core and give us our mission which is improving our members' lives through advocacy and member services. We want to commend uh, Dean Buckner, as well as Chancellor Alexander, for hosting another successful Rural Life Conference. We look forward to continue to be a part of this effort. Thank you. Each year, the dedication committee nominates an individual or individuals and submit the nominee or nominees to the Rural Life Conference Task Force for consideration for the honor to dedicate the current Rural Life Conference. The honorees are chosen because of their contributions to the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Human Sciences, and their rural community development involvement, improving the quality of life for people in communities, and for positive contributions to the Rural Life Conference. The 2017 recipient was reared on a farm in Cotton Plant, Arkansas, where his parents grew cotton and vegetables as their primary crops. His professional career spanned over 40 years before he retired in January 2016 from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. This year's recipient has missed only one Rural Life Conference during the past 20 years. And even in his retirement, this year he is currently serving on the Rural Life Conference Workshop Committee and also 
the recruitment committee. Prior to his retirement, our honorees, ser our honorees served at every level in the Arkansas Natural Resources Conservation Service from a biological aide with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a college intern. Then on to serving as a soil conservationist with the Soil Conservation Service, which is now called the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, and, and to his highest rank when he retired as Natural Resources Specialist with, the outre with outreach responsibilities. He has served in various roles at both the district and state levels in various counties. While serving as a soil conservationist at the South Central Water Management Center, he provided leadership in developing a partnership agreement for NRCS and UAPB to develop the 871-acre Lone Oak Demonstration Farm. This year's recipient has received numerous awards and recognition throughout his career, and they are too numerous to name in this setting, but I will name a few which includes a life membership in the National Organization of Professional Black Employees, and he also served as Arkansas's first president of that chapter. He received the NRCS Partnership Award for the Lone Oak Farm Development. Our recipient is also a member of several professional organizations in the soil and water conservation arena, and also he is a member of several civic and fraternal organizations, such as the Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity. Our recipient is, active, is an active member of the Mount Nebo Baptist Church here in Pine Bluff, where he serves as a deacon. He and his beautiful wife, Gwen, Gwen, will you stand so that, so that they can, uh, where is Gwen? Okay, Gwen, will you stand so that everybody can see you so we won't think that you are his youngest sister. Yeah, <clears throat> he and his wife, Gwen, they have two daughters, Shalanda and Sharita, and also a six-year-old grandson, Caleb. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2017 Rural Life Dedication Committee unanimously nominated and presented the recipient's name to the overall Rural Life Conference Task Force, and they overwhelmingly approved, and we proudly present the 61st Annual Rural Life Conference Dedication Award to none other than Mr. Theotis Bunch. Mr. Bunch, will you come forward? And we'll ask Dr. Buckner to present Mr. Bunch with his award. Good morning. <clears throat> to Chancellor Alexander, he was here a moment ago, uh, Dean Buckner, and distinguished platform guests. I am humbled and very honored to have been nominated and selected by the task force for such a distinguished honor. I must pause briefly to extend my wholehearted thanks to everyone who played a part in making this occasion possible for me. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, briefly, as I look back over my life, I must say that I had a very humble beginning. I'm the third born of 16 siblings. We were born on a small farm in Cotton Plant, Arkansas, in the East Arkansas Delta. And we worked the land as a means of survival. Uh, I'm the first in the family to go off to college. And I stand here today to say that I'm proud to announce that I graduated from the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff in 1975 with a Bachelor of Science degree in agronomy. And I must say, I had many, many sponsors along the way. I credit 
Well, first of all, I, I've attended most real life conferences, but I never ever dreamed that this honor would come my way. That's why I'm so humbled today and thankful for this opportunity. You know, I credit my achievements in life first and foremost to God. And secondly, I credit those achievements to my mother who's no longer with us. But she taught us humility through a selfless acts of kindness to everyone that had a need. She never met a stranger. So I know she would be proud of me today. And I feel like she's smiling as I stand here as your honoree. Before I go, the last thing I want to do is acknowledge my wife, whom y'all just saw stand a minute ago, Gwen, and my daughter, Shalanda, who was here with me today, both graduated from this institution. I also have my brother, James, uh, who's a graduate of this institution, and his wife, Christine, that live across the river over in Cordova, Tennessee. They came out today as well. My brother, Eddie, and his wife, Gwen, Gwen too, I call her. You know, we've got two Gwens in the family, three Gwens in the family. Uh, they are graduates of Fayetteville, the main campus. And I'm thankful that they came out. And uh, my baby sister, Jessie, is here. And I uh, thought her husband would be here, but he, he, he's working. He's a Walmart worker, so he had work. But Jessie has a daughter that's a freshman here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. She's majoring in agriculture. Her name is Jessica. So I just want to acknowledge Jessica <laughs> because she, she's certainly dedicated to the cause. And I'd just like to acknowledge the many friends that came out to show support to me. My former coworkers, I see some back there. I thank you for coming. And church members that came out in a sure support as well. I know I'm standing between you and refreshments, so the last thing I want to do is, is thank you again for all the recognition, and I am truly, truly humbled for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, Mr. Bunch, we usually like to wait for the awardees to retire. That way we can put them back to work for us here in the Ag School of Ag, Fisheries, and Human Sciences, so get ready. <laughs> okay. Um, next up, we have one other change to the program. Uh, the program chair, Dr. Brenda Martin, who's chair of the Human Sciences Department, has a special presentation. Dr. Martin. Good morning. Um, it has been my pleasure to serve as a chair for the 61st Annual Rural Life Conference. Um, and we are very happy to have Dr. Krokel to come all the way down from Washington, D.C. Um, to, to be with us this morning. And so if Dr. Krokel would join me up at the platform, we have a small token of our appreciation. Um, on behalf of the Rural Life Conference Task Force, the School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Human Sciences, and the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, we want to extend our thanks to you for your information that you provided for us this morning and to um, hope you have safe travels back. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure. On behalf of the School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Human Sciences, and especially the faculty, staff, students, and chair, Dr. Brenda Martin, from the Department of Human Sciences, who's serving as this year's host department for the 61st Rural Life Conference. We would like to thank and commend all program participants for their participation during our morning opening session. Special thanks to our chancellor in his absence, Dr. Lawrence B. Alexander, for his heartfelt greetings, for Mayor Washington, for a welcome to our city, for Dr. Buckner for making all of this possible, for Ms. Crosby for her invocation, and our international Vespa Choir, on the direction of Dr. Michael Bates 
for those beautiful songs for our listening pleasure. To my colleague, Kate Dutra, for her introduction of our speaker this morning, Dr. Crockle. Dr. Crockle, thank you so much for your message to us this morning and the work that you are doing to create and facilitate a national and unified theme in promoting community and family vitality across all disciplines to create and prepare our next generation of professionals. Mr. Roth, you did an excellent job with your dedication. To our honoree, Mr. Theotis Bunch, congratulations. And now, during this particular time, until 1015, we invite you to take this opportunity to view the posters, visit the exhibits, network, interact with conference participants, and participate in the workshops that have been prepared to design to promote vitality in the Arkansas rural communities. And lastly, we invite you to convene and come back and dine in the banquet hall around 1245 with the delicious food that's prepared for rice catering and listen to our luncheon speaker, Mr. Jack Cromley, where you can refer to page 16 to find out more about him, who's a former senator of Arkansas District 16, who's just happened to be my uncle. Thank you and enjoy the conference. The closing session is now adjourned.